Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. We are very privileged to have with us Admiral Sir Mark Steinhope, uh, First Sea Lord and Chief of Naval Staff, um, uh, who's dedicated the next hour to speak to us about the chosen topic of influence without embroilment, which in the wake of the Libyan operation last year uh, and various other operations the Royal Navy involved in uh, is an extremely timely issue and one that follows us on from the SDSR and the NSS um, in 2010 very effectively. Um, a couple of housekeeping issues. Um, the presentation itself, which will last about 30 minutes, is on the record, um, so feel free to take notes and uh, publish them if you want to. Uh, the Q&A afterwards, which will last for another uh, 30 minutes, is off the record, so if we can uh, make sure that anything said then stays within the room, that will allow us for the most free-flowing and open conversation we can possibly have. Um, I don't think the, uh, the Admiral needs any particular um, introduction, given his, uh, his standing and his history, so I will let him uh, get on with the presentation itself. Ladies and, and gentlemen, good afternoon, and thank you, Christian, for the very best introduction I've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> I'm now out there, and I don't need to be introduced. That's really good to know. <laughs> it's two years to the very day, in fact, uh, that I was last here and had the pleasure of speaking uh, at the IISS. Uh, I have to say, frankly, it feels sometimes like uh, uh, two months, such as the pace of life uh, in the um, defence world as a whole and, frankly, uh, uh, life in general at, at the moment. Back then, of course, pre-election, pre-SDSR, I talked about the need to strive for greater utility from the forces and capabilities that we do have and how the unique attributes of maritime forces can help us do exactly that. Such themes are even more acutely relevant today, I feel. So thank you for inviting me again to build upon some of those thoughts. Going back more years than I care to remember, my role as a submarine commander in the 1980s was dictated by the realities of the Cold War and the deterrent strategy that underpinned it. So today's title, Influence Without Embroilment, by which I mean achieving a significant effect with a minimum risk to enduring presence, is quite close to my heart. Now, the Prime Minister said in his Mansion House speech in November that, and I quote, this country has always been at its best when it projects its influence, unquote. Well, over the next half an hour or so, I wish to illustrate how maritime power is such a compelling expression of this country's influence. Maritime power, the ability to influence people or events from the sea at a time and place of political choosing, is, of course, not a new concept. As an island nation, we have been projecting marito, uh, uh, British interests of security, of prosperity and freedom through the use of the sea for many centuries. Today, we project our influence through a complex counterpoint of the instruments of national power, diplomatic, economic and military. From a naval perspective, this ranges from, on the one hand, providing, as the Strategic Deterrence and Security Review put it, the ultimate insurance policy in this age of uncertainty in the form of the submarine-based continuous at-sea deterrence, which is, interestingly, in its 43rd year. Two, on the other hand, supporting the peaceful aims of the Antarctic Treaty System through the deployment of HMS Protector, our latest ice patrol ship, for example. Indeed, she's currently in the Southern Oceans on her austral summer deployment as I speak. In our complex and uncertain world, uh, in which our fate is increasingly conjoined with others, John Doan's invocation, no man is an island, has never, I think, been truer. And with the national security strategy concluding that, and I get, again I quote, the risk picture is likely to become increasingly diverse, unquote, it makes good sense in my view that the strategic 
uh, interest and the strategy placed on premium, and I quote, identifying risks early and treating the causes rather than having to deal with the consequences is of huge significance. This means that militarily we must retain intervention capabilities should we need to respond as crises emerge, for sure. But it also means that we need to rightly consider our response to the prevention of conflict. And it is these two aspects of influence without embroilment. First, intervention along the lines of Libya, and second, prevention, such as long-term maritime security in the Middle East. It's these that I want to explore further from my perception as the nation's maritime advisor for defense and security. Let me take what I would term the engagement of intervention first, the ability to respond to events. If we learn nothing else from the unfolding narratives across the Maghreb, and Libya of course in particular, they serve as a timely reminder that the capacity for world events to surprise even the very best prepared of us should not be underestimated. Which is why one of the SDR's innovations, the Response Force Task Group, otherwise known as the RFTG, proved so successful in achieving effective influence right across the Maghreb last year. In conceptual terms, the RFTG is a quick reaction force consisting of ships, aircraft, and Royal Marines suited to a range of defense tasks from maritime strike to disaster relief, from amphibious operations to civilian evacuation. Poised off the coast in international waters or exercising the right of innocent passage through territorial waters, it is able to influence events ashore by deterring aggression, promoting stability, and providing options for military intervention if required. This capacity to use the freedom and flexibility of the sea to maneuver and, for example, to insert and withdraw high-end land forces is one, of the very f is one of the very few nations in this uh, world that possess it. We, the UK, are one of the few that, that possess it. Recent examples of its use, of course, are the US Marine Corps' <coughs> delivery of... Uh, the uh, Iraqi army in 1991, deceiving the um, uh, uh, Iraqi army uh, for a long period of time by poisoning off Kuwait. UK landing the Royal Marines on the Alfor Peninsula in 2003. And we should not forget that at least one other nation has utilized such a capability in the recent past. Russia used it in Georgia in 2008. So you can see how such a quick reaction force is a highly prized capability. But I, I want to focus on our Quick Reaction Force's recent response to Libya, a campaign in which I'm immensely proud of all of our armed forces personnel who work so courageously and professionally with other government departments and, of course, with other nations to achieve NATO and the United Nations intent. Just as do our brave men and women serving in Afghanistan and elsewhere around the world do today as well. Last year, the RFTG, consisting of seven warships with an embarked commando unit and naval he he helicopters, demonstrated the concept by undertaking separate yet simultaneous missions in different theatres and by contributing to a complex joint and multinational campaign. By mid-June, you will recall, NATO's operations to protect Libya and its civilians from Gaddafi's regime forces had removed the immediate threat of humanitarian disaster, but a degree of stalemate had developed on the ground, a stalemate in which Libyan civilians were still very much the victims. It was becoming imperative to reassert our resolve to see the matter through to the very end and to ratchet up the pressure on the regime even further. The RFTG had already sailed from the United Kingdom to provide options for the government. 
Consequently, one of the ships in the task group, HMS Ocean, joined the operations in a maritime strike role with her five Army Air Corps at Apache attack helicopters, a capacity, indeed, we had been working up for a number of years beforehand. Flying from ships that could range up and down the coast with relative impunity, the Apache, together, of course, with their French equivalents, were able to deliver short, reactive missions with precise strike missiles onto targets where collateral damage was unacceptable, adding both further military firepower and, importantly, a new psychological dimension to the operation, an effort that was sustained, indeed, until the fall of the Gaddafi regime. Concurrently, the RFTG group as a whole was reconfigured with the other RFTG ships being forward deployed to provide contingent capability east of Suez whilst actively strengthening relations through international engagement with key partners. And because naval assets have such in 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 inherent mobility, the RFTG units were not the only naval units to be repositioned around the world at this time. For example, a year ago today, the frigate HMS Cumberland, on her way home from the Gulf after, after a five-month deployment, was diverted to Benghazi. Joined by HMS York and HMS Westminster, in response to growing concern over the safety of civilians, together with warships, uh, together, these warships extracted nearly 500 British and other nationals to safety. Cumberland then remained in theatre until mid-April, becoming one of the first NATO units to enforce the UN maritime arms and oil embargo around Libya, as well, of course, as build the maritime surveillance picture. Moreover, in mid-March, with the security situation deteriorating, it was apparent that more robust military action might be necessary to avoid a humanitarian tragedy. And yet it was a time when further overt military preparations could well have prejudiced delicate negotiations. Against this backdrop, the submarine HMS Triumph headed discreetly to a holding location in the southern central Mediterranean. She remained unnoticed right up until the moment she fired the opening United Kingdom salvo of the campaign, launching her Tomahawk land attack missiles against key Gaddafi regime command and air defence facilities, preempting, of course, the follow-on air strikes. HMS Triumph, assisted by her sister submarine HMS Turbulent, spent over three months deployed in support of this operation. She also spent protracted periods close to the coast, gathering vital surveillance information. As a typical il illustration of this, consider the following. Under cover of darkness, pro-Gaddafi special forces were using fast inflatable boats in repeated attempts to mine the port of the besieged city of Misrata, the only route, of course, in for essential humanitarian supplies at that time. A simple but highly effective way of disrupting NATO and the United Nations intent. Other boats were towed out, packed with high explosives, presumably in an attempt to attack NATO vessels. Triumph sonars, sonars detected the boats as they left base and under her surveillance UK and NATO warships were with their embarked helicopters able to intercept and disrupt every attempted raid. Some of these raiders did indeed release mines from their boats before they were sunk. The mine hunters HMS Rocklesby and HMS Bangor, in conjunction with a small number of other NATO partners, became instrumental in keeping key Libyan ports free of the hugely disruptive threats of mining to ensure that vital humanitarian supplies could continue to be delivered. It was slow, painstaking and hazardous work just a few thousand yards off a dangerous shore and under the constant threat of, and on occasions actual, hostile fire. In so many ways, the United Kingdom's contribution to the maritime effort in 
in liberating Libya speaks for itself. 16 naval ships and submarines, collectively spending over 700 days off the Libyan coast, and with 3,100 naval personnel deployed. HMS Ocean's Air Group conducted over 1,300 deck landings during this period alone. The mine hunters spent over 80 days close inshore. Nearly 500 people, as I've already indicated, were evacuated from Libyan ports. And the most extensive use of naval gunfire by a Royal Naval warship, notably HMS Liverpool, witnessed since the Falklands War. All of this sustained by the supply ships of the Royal Fleet Auxiliary, providing constant logistic support to both UK and, indeed, NATO warships. All this, even in terms of this engagement of intervention, has been achieved with, I would suggest, the lightest of touches. So what can we draw from this? There are three things which I believe are particularly striking. Although entirely typical of the way in which the Royal Navy, along with other navies, delivers maritime effect, the points, I hope, are worthy of emphasis. First, the naval forces were involved in a huge range of activity, whether this was the successful extraction of British and other nationals.